Welcome back to our panel discussion, Building a DevSecOps Mindset in Government, sponsored by Red Hat, here on federalnewsradio.com and Federal News Radio 1500 AM. My guests today are Pamela Wise Martinez, Chief Cloud and Enterprise Data Architect at the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Adam Clater is Chief Architect in the Office of the Chief Technologist at Red Hat's North American Public Sector. Shane Barney is Deputy Chief Information Security Officer at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. And William Tinston is Program Executive Officer for Information Operations at the Defense Logistics Agency. And before the break, we were getting deep into the idea of automation, of the many steps and processes involved in software development. And automation is easy to say, but I guess I'm wondering how you get there. And Bill, why don't we start with you? Well, we're kind of feeling our way there at the moment. Um, we don't have a defined platform that we make everyone use or a defined set of tools. Where, as Pamela was, was discussing earlier, looking at what's right for each program, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of tools out there with a lot of names I can't even pronounce, let alone remember. Um, and we're just feeling our way through what gets us there uh, in small segments, trying to see how the tool chain works and seeing w w which types of code it works for and then what our, what our future plan is going to be. We, we haven't committed to a single set of automation tools. Um, but part of what we're trying to do is even get away from, uh, you used the, the term orchestrating the automation earlier, but even doing that and moving away from the development so that, uh, uh, as Shane said, as we get to the cloud, we want to get beyond infrastructure as a service and just putting our stuff up in the cloud. Where practical, we want to get to a platform as a service where the security of the platform is handled by somebody else or even better, uh, a software as a service or a capability as a service where, where the, the security is provided by somebody else, we get the benefit of the business capability at uh, reduced cost, uh, less investment, and it's evergreen, right? Uh, at DLA, we've done that with uh, our office automation stuff. We, we have a cloud-based provider that provides all the office automation stuff. We're doing it with our LMS, learning management system. We're shifting to a as a service, software as a service delivery of that. And, and that's really our target. And in the meantime, we're looking at the automation of what we continue to deliver and, and increasing the automation there. But, but our real goal is to get away from delivery of software when it comes right down to it. And then as a service, much of that security. So at some point, even the platform itself becomes a software service yes. by virtualizing Yes, the, and, the and that's network. in the middle. We want to get so, to the point where the capability, and, and we have some places where we've done it, where the capability is coming to us as a service. Yeah, so that means that the development of virtualized sets of hardware infrastructure, yeah. the network and the storage, et cetera, right. itself becomes something subject to the security testing regime that you have for the applications that yes. eventually ride on top of that. Absolutely, and even we don't have to manage the security of the platform if we're getting the capability as a service. Shane? Um, yeah, and I'd like to, to feed on that, and I, and I actually appreciate Bill's approach. Uh, my uh, cyber defense chief, loves to, uh, Adrian Monza, loves to say, if you want to go fast, you need to go slow. Um, and he's got a valid point. I, I think the world of cloud, it, 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 it's ripe with shiny objects. Um, and for anybody who falls in sort of the geek kind of profile, and I, and I admit I'm one of them, the shiny object syndrome is something to be very leery of because you're always looking for the next and the best and the greatest and you're always kind of reaching over that horizon when you haven't really dealt with what you have on the ground. Um, so, so really taking that slow sort of a, approach to, to how you get there from here is, is of value. Um, but there's also another principle that I think that needs to come into play here, and, and that is sort of the, you know, the, uh, within the Agile uh, methodology and, and within DevOps as well, there, you have to remove the fear, your to, fear to fail. Um, government is ripe with fear to fail. We, we, we have a lot of regulation around failure. Um, you know, the first thing we do in an incident is we look for who did it. Um, that, that notion has to shift. There has to be this cultural change. Um, you know, and, and I'm not going to say USCIS is perfect at it. We're you know, by far not there yet, but we are striving towards being there. We're, we're, we're embracing failure where, because what failure represents is not necessarily, oh, we failed as an organization, we failed with our mission. What failure represents is a learning opportunity. Oh, well, this has failed. So, you know, within the code development world, they, they, want, they start testing code almost immediately. I mean, it's, it's barely out the door, and they're already testing because they want it to fail. If it fails, they know where the, the problem is, and they can address the problem. Security is no different. 
Um, and it, but, but you know, don't correct me. Let me stop right there, though. You know, in the security world, if I fail at, as being a CISO in in a very larger sense, well, that's going to be a very bad day, and we would be having a very different type of interview. Um, you want to fail the second the code is finished. I would rather them fail very when early it's on when it's still within a controlled environment that it can be addressed. You know, that being said, though, I never want to sit back and say, oh, well, I've got all this automation in place. I'm good to go. I've, I've covered my bases. That's actually going right back to checkbox security, mm -hmm. where you're really not getting any value add. You always have to, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be, have shiny syndrome, shiny sh object syndrome, you gotta apply it to security as well. And within the security world, that means you're looking at the next horizon for what the hackers are going to do next. That's your pen test team. They are your chaos monkeys. They are the ones that are gonna come in and wreak havoc across your organization. Um, my pen testers love to do this. Because um, I give them carte blank with my system, with my, 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 my accounts and my computers. So they can do whatever they want to me. Just please don't do it to my director. Um, and they do on a frequent basis. I've been fired via email. but I've actually sent myself an email and been fired by my own self by them. I've had pop-ups that's fired me before. I, I've had everything under the sun. But what they, what they're... <laughs> What they, what, yeah, I know. Um, should I take a hint? No. But what they're doing is they're, they're, they're demonstrating you know, holes within our organization that we have missed. And every single time we find one of those, we plug it. And then we move on. And we move on. Now, we're getting to a point, actually, just the other day, we ran a pen test exercise. Um, and our SOC, and our SOC operations, we, we anticipated we'd be able to probably kind of skirt around the edges for a while, for about an hour, before our SOC would pick it up. Um, they caught it within about 12 minutes. Um, it was an impressive feat, actually, um, to the point where my pen test team was really upset. And, and I'm like, guys, you're the ones who developed these tools. I mean, you actually helped them get that point. But they got to that point because we kept testing and kept testing and kept testing. We never get, we never get comfortable where we're at. Um, and, and I think that's really a, a really important piece. So, and especially when you start talking about containerizations, microservices, and all these catchwords out there, you know, microservices, our, our uh, e-verifications, our verifications uh, portfolio is if heavily invested in microservices. Um, microservices are a form of containerization. Okay. So it's Which a way of, way of containing, you know, it's basically what it does is you look at microservices, I kind of view them as like independent little mini micro like code, right? So they, they do one thing and they do it really, really well. And that's what they do. Is that the modern equivalent of objects? No. No. Um, that's not how I term it. So think of microservices as usually you have like a really large application. Your application may do five or six different things. You've got to log in, you've got to look at some data, you're going to update some data, and then you're going to do some other activities, right? Well, that login service, we're just going to write a little service that does that, and that's going to be a microservice over here. And then as we get load coming up, we can scale that horizontally mm -hmm. as we need to, and then scale it back down. Not everybody needs to be able to log in all the time. Right, maybe right. You people, surges, right, you have people, surges yeah. of activity. So what's great is you take a little microservice, you put it into a container, and then you have an orchestration that can scale that horizontally and sort of manage it and have relationships between if I've got five of these, maybe I need two of those, and sort of manage all of that infrastructure around the microservice. So what a lot of people are doing with application development is taking those big applications and chopping them up into their little components, writing microservices around them, and then deploying those in their infrastructure. It goes really well with DevOps because the authentication develops team can be over here doing their job while the folks doing some other part of the business logic can be over there doing theirs and by decoupling those larger components of the application we can uh, be much more agile and DevSecOps friendly in the way that we're developing our apps. And for me also you're spreading out your risk. Yep. Um, you're taking all of those little tiny pieces of a very larger application and you're breaking them down to smaller pieces where in theory you may have a risk here, but you're not going to have a risk across the entire enterprise. You can deal with that easier, faster, and you can hopefully automate it, especially on the alert side. But so I think the biggest value of that is really reuse, because you know, from an enterprise perspective, enterprise architecture perspective, and from a solo perspective, that was always our goal. It was principally reuse, but also um, the benefit to the um, value to the uh, business, as well as the IT strategy and making sure that IT is less the burden. Because you know, we don't like to be cost centers, but we've solely become these huge cost centers, and we want to move away from those uh, that kind of uh, uh, you know activity. 
value. So we want to be valued to the business. So that's one of the major things I think uh, service, that, that type of architecture has brought to the table, giving us the ability. But going back to the continuous uh, sort of integration, continuous develop automation, I think automation is really, from that perspective, is the game changer. At PBGC, we started looking at, um, you know, Chef and Puppet and Jenkins and all the, the different tools that were out there that were open source now. Uh, granted, again, being a small organization, you're not going to jump out there and, and be the first to, to test something. Certainly these things have been tested over and over and over. Red Hat, Google, I mean, you name it, AWS. You know, these tools have been tried and true and used. However, being a small agency, you still have that concern. You still have that, you know, concern about how you're going to, you know, evaluate and jump, put your toe in the water, if you will. But I think through automation, we have the ability to what you call leapfrog. You know, we can leapfrog over some of the things that have not worked so well for, for some of the larger organizations. We can learn from, you know, organizations like USISC, you know, so we can learn from various organizations, DOD, that have, that are doing things in a DevOps environment, they're doing uh, the DevSec, that are doing, you know, this rugged IT, if you will. We can learn from them and we can leapfrog and take advantage of automation and building uh, systems that are more rugged. Yeah, so that knowledge transfer and also the concept of reuse mm -hmm. thanks to microservices and containerization, Adam, that sort of plays into your idea of Kaizen. Yeah. A lot less waste. That, that's absolutely right. And you know, when we talk about cloud, we've got sort of both views of cloud, I think, here at the table, which is always really interesting. And there's there's multiple, right? It's always the sort of what does cloud mean to you today? Because um, it's a continual evolution. But I think you know, on one hand, we've got sort of this view of sort of the traditional data center infrastructure as a service view, which is great because you can start automating things within your data center today without costing any money, any additional cost mm -hmm. uh, with regard to cloud consumption. You can automate your way into your cloud provider, right? So you don't have operators sort of spinning up virtual machines in a cloud service, which means you can also automate your way out of that cloud provider. And I think one of the things that's important to understand about cloud adoption is you really need to have an exit strategy so you don't get completely locked into a cloud provider. Automation really helps you build that foundation. It doesn't complete the exit strategy, but it sort of gets you on the path to that exit strategy. On the other side, I think we've got sort of this software as a service focused approach, right? Which is, I'm going to take a look at my organization and I'm going to see lines of business drawn to applications and I want to pick those up and move those out so that someone else is responsible for those things. And that's all good and fine and great and that's a very successful approach. I think as an IT organization, you take on sort of this integration task though, right? How do I integrate all of these applications? And I think as an organization, that becomes your intellectual property, if you will. That's the value that you drive through the organization. Um, and then I think at, at the end, you take a look at your, your infrastructure and you say, okay, some of this I've just got to lift and shift out to a cloud and we're going to automate the deployment of that. And then you sort of get to this sort of, you know, you get to the FCC, we're 100% in the cloud or, or someone else like that, which I think those are great approaches. So I did talk about software as a service as an end state that we want to get to with many of our capabilities, but it is not where everything is going to go. Okay. And so I think that the, the decomposition of our systems into microservices, mm -hmm. containerized things, mm -hmm. um, certainly gives us the opportunity for reuse, mm -hmm. but I think the real benefit that comes to us there is we've actually decomposed the systems and we're talking about capabilities and we get away from uh, managing by systems and an expectation from the business side that that system's going to do that thing for me and they try and manage IT for us. Right. So, so I, I think that's where the real powerful benefit of, of decomposing the capabilities that comprise the system yeah, is going to accrue to us. There is a lot of power there and a lot to be realized. There are some, obviously, some interesting thing, pitfalls that one has to be careful of. I mean, a considerable amount of planning has to go into containerization. Uh, you have to plan for container outages. You have to plan for if this container goes down, what picks it slack up? You know, what does this container kick in? Does this container kick in? Having a simple container going out is is a, is a bad day. Um, you also have to have a very, very robust and very integrated uh, ICAM type environment. So you've got to have very tight controls on your authentication, your your uh, you know your privileged access, especially. Um, and who has access to those containers. Now, you know, honestly, if the end state goal actually of automation really for us is to remove the human from production, mm -hmm. there should be no human beings in production ever. Um, production should be the outcome of, a pro of an automated process. 
Um, in other words, it's gone through all of its bells and whistles, it's gone through its checks, um, we're, we're good to go, we give it the red thumbs up and someone pushes a button and off it launches. Um, you know, you've got like four, I've, you know, if I had my way, I'd have four really, sure. really trusted domain administrators with, with access to my production environment for the, you know, oh my goodness, the world is on fire, we need to do something about it situation, but beyond that, I don't want anyone there. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we're moving heavily there. I, there's a lot of those security principles that you really, the automation's going to enable, but again, go back to my, my good friend Adrian Monza saying, if you want to go fast, you need to go slow. Um, cultural change is key. Sure, and a quick question, uh, just to get back to that idea of the develop of the automation tools, and you know, Bill, you said you hadn't settled on them. How uh, do they? What is the relationship between the automation tools that you choose and say your development environment or language? Are they agnostic of one another? Can you keep? So the I don't believe they are. I think you need to be looking at. Uh, uh, the environment you're delivering in and what the most appropriate tools in that environment Same are. Skills. Right, yeah. and, and what the teams are able to do and, and what training you can get for them. Uh, so we, we want to make it as standard as possible and I think there's an integration, uh, there's another name for it, but sort of an integration layer of those tools that you want to be as standard as you can there and then you want the right additional tools to deal with the code bases that you're dealing with as you deliver. Adam, anything to add? Uh, we're almost out of time, but you get the final word here. Oh, well, you know, it's, this has been sort of a great, really comprehensive type of conversation, so thank you guys for being here. Um, I agree. I think that your CI CD pipeline is going to be informed by sort of the skills, the capability, the language, um, and plugging security testing into that pipeline mm -hmm. and making that all part of the equation. I, I think we just figured out what DevSecOps is. Right. All right, well that's a good place to end. We are out of time. I want to thank today's guests. Shane Barney is the Deputy Chief Information Security Officer at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. William Tinston is Program Executive Officer for Information Operations at the Defense Logistics Agency. Pamela Wise Martinez, Chief Cloud and Enterprise Data Architect at the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. And Adam Clater, Chief Architect in the Office of the Chief Technologist at Red Hat's North America Public Sector. I'm your moderator, Tom Tennyson. FederalNewsRadio.com and Federal News Radio 1500 AM. For more on this discussion, visit FederalNewsRadio.com. Use the search term Red Hat. On behalf of Red Hat, thank you for joining us. The archive session will be available shortly. If you qualified for continuing education credit, you will also receive an email with your training certification. This concludes our discussion. Thank you.